Hello, welcome to another in a series of Open Philosophy videos. In this video we will be continuing our discussion of probability and randomness in evolution. We will be concentrating particularly on the idea that evolution has pre-programmed targets. Last time we saw that Richard Dawkins attempted to meet the improbability objection by writing a computer program designed to contrast complete randomness with what he called cumulative step selection. There's nothing wrong with cumulative step selection. The problem is the interpretation. To get the steps to accumulate to the target that Dawkins wanted, he put the target in up front. Then, as each letter was selected randomly, if it matched the target, it was locked down. At the bottom of the screen, Dawkins shows us what happens when we don't have a target. Essentially nothing. Of course, targets don't have to be put in explicitly. We can have implicit targets. For example, if I were to write a program to calculate pi, I would not preload it. But if I did not program a series of steps designed to give us pi, I would never get pi out. It is therefore difficult to see how we can get anything useful out of a process which does not have implicit or explicit targets. What does this have to do with biology? Just as a computer program controls a computer, so the laws of nature, which biologists call natural selection, control evolution. To make it clear that I'm not distorting Dawkins' point or twisting his words, let's read the summary off the last page of The Blind Watchmaker. However improbable a large-scale change may be, smaller changes are less improbable. And, provided we postulate a sufficiently large series of sufficiently finely graded intermediaries, we shall be able to derive anything from anything else, without invoking astronomical improbabilities. We are allowed to do this only if there is sufficient time to fit all the intermediaries in, and also only if there is a mechanism for guiding each step in some particular direction. Otherwise, the sequence of steps will career off in an endless random walk. Sadly, this statement contains a lot of misdirection. In fact, one might almost assume that it was designed to draw our attention away from the critical phrase that I've highlighted. Let's take a look at the idea that a number of sufficiently small steps will overcome improbability. Let's take the simple example of coin tossing. Suppose that we take 50 pennies and we toss them all in the air at the same time. What is the chance that we're going to get all heads? It's about one in a quadrillion. Now let's try to overcome this staggering improbability by using Dawkins' strategy. Suppose that we decide that instead of tossing all 50 coins in the air at once, we're going to toss 10. Just as Dawkins said, the chance of getting 10 heads at one time is much higher than getting 50 heads. It's about one in a thousand. So, encouraged by this, let's toss another ten heads to get twenty, and then another ten to get thirty, and then another ten to get forty, and finally another ten to get fifty. So, have we beaten the odds? No, because the odds of tossing fifty heads in a row is the same as the odds of tossing fifty heads all at once, one in a quadrillion. So Dawkins' idea that dividing the process up into sufficiently fine steps will help us overcome improbability is simply untrue. The only thing that really helps is having a mechanism to guide each step in a particular direction. What difference is there between guidance in some direction and having an implicit target? Guidance in any direction leads to a target. Still, the idea that evolution has targets is an extremely strong claim because it runs counter to the naturalist spin that evolution drifts mindlessly. The great American evolutionary theorist Stephen Jay Gould argued in two ways against the idea of targets in evolution. Gould argued that our perception of progress is due to a misapprehension. While the statistical diversity of organisms is increasing, the average organism is still a bacteria, so there is no goal-seeking. Human beings are an aberration on the fringe of a statistical distribution. This shows the importance of the conceptual space into which we project data. In the space of statistical concepts, human beings are an anomaly. 
In the space of teleological concepts, human beings result from means evolved over eons. Which projection is right? They both are. Consider the pyramids. The capstone is a statistical outlier in the distribution of elevations, but it is still supported by what lies beneath it. The statistical view is not wrong. It's incomplete. All the data on the evolution of developmental mechanisms, all of the data on the interdependence of ecological systems, on the history of progressive elaboration, are projected out of the statistical view. We are a statistical anomaly, but that anomaly is the pinnacle supported by means evolved over eons. The statistical picture is not an argument against goal-seeking, it's just what we would expect for a capstone. Gould's second objection against targets in evolution is that if you rewound the evolutionary tape and played it again, it would come out different and we would not be here. While this claim may sound sensible to biologists, people familiar with quantum physics know that it can't be true. In quantum physics, the only random process is observation. All unobserved processes, and evolution of course occurred without anybody observing it, all unobserved processes are deterministic. As Leonard Susskind points out in his book The Black Hole War, however many times we run a process such as evolution backward and forward in time, as long as we don't interfere with it by trying to measure it, it will always turn out to be exactly the same. And so, if targets mean that evolution will always have the same result, then certainly evolution has targets. Okay, you say. All this sounds good in theory, but is there any hard evidence of targets in evolution? The answer is yes. Plants and animals in different evolutionary lines converge on objectively similar forms to fit objectively similar niches. Hundreds of examples of the same target form being arrived at from different origins have been observed, just as would happen if you ran Dawkins' text program many times. Similar leaf forms, skull forms, tongue forms, pheromones, antibodies, and so on have evolved at widely separated locales from different genetic stocks among birds, reptiles, fish, spiders, and plants. In each case, objectively similar forms evolved. In our first example, we see that the euphorbia of Africa and southern Asia and the cactacea of the Americas evolved independently but converged to forms so similar that you would think that they were closely related. They are not. In our second example, we compare the Tasmanian marsupial wolf to the canid wolf that we're familiar with. If you look closely, you'll see that the skull forms are almost identical, even though the lines that they come from split in the Cretaceous over 125 million years ago. These are just two of the many examples of convergent evolution, proving the existence of objective target forms.